right, well, good morning, everybody. So, uh, just the usual Wednesday reminder, don't forget to turn your homework in. Um, again, the homework that I put on the board last time will be due next Wednesday. So, uh, hopefully you're working on your homework, and of course, hopefully you finished the homework that was due today. Um, I will post the solutions when I get back to my office um, right after class. So, you know, it'll be up there by quarter to 12 or thereabouts. Um, and I'm only posting the solutions outside my office. I'm not putting them on Blackboard. They're not going to be in any kind of electronic form. So I do it the old-fashioned way. If you want to look at the solutions and, you know, review them, then please look at the glass case outside my office. That's where it's going to be. Uh, and I'll keep the homework up there for at least until the midterm exam that deals with that material. So don't feel like you have to rush to look at the solutions this day or this week. Um, they'll be up there for several weeks. Okay. So we're talking about the air standard auto cycle. Uh, this is just one of really what turned out to be many cycles that can model different reciprocating engines. Um, the auto cycle is a decent model for the spark ignition engine, or the gasoline engine, if you will. Um, after we talk about the auto cycle, then we'll move on to the diesel cycle, which is a cycle that is, you know, reasonable at modeling a diesel engine. Um, but let's just stick with the auto cycle first. Um, keep in mind that, uh, just as a bit of review, um, there's a few terms of interest to us, right? Um, the heat transfer on a per unit mass that comes in, based on the first law, we, we saw this last time, is just U4 minus U1, um, the heat that is rejected from the system, the Q out. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I've got these reversed. The Q out is U4 minus U1. Um, the heat into the cycle takes place between points two and three, so clearly this is U3 minus U2. Um, we also know that the net work is just the difference between the work out and the work in. And of course, these work processes, again, from the first law of thermodynamics, are just based on an internal energy change. So work goes out between points three and four, so U3 minus U4, and the work in is our compression from one to two, so just minus U2 minus U1. Um, and then keep in mind also that we're often interested in the thermodynamic efficiency, um, and this can either be written as the net work over the heat input, or just one minus uh, the heat output over the heat input. I mean, both of these are, are acceptable forms of our thermodynamic efficiency equation. Um, so we can solve, you know, for any of a bunch of different types of problems. You know, sometimes we're interested in finding the efficiency. Sometimes we're interested in finding how much heat has to be added. Sometimes we're interested in how much work or network has to be done. Um, but these are just the general equations that we would utilize. And again, these were all presented um, and really derived for you last time. Uh, what I want to do at this point is to just develop a slightly different version of the thermodynamic efficiency equation. Um, I'll start with this version, 1 minus heat out over heat in. So just substituting in the internal energy terms, U4 minus U1 over U3 minus U2. Okay. Now, before I proceed, um, let me just note that we could solve these problems, again, these air standard auto cycle problems, either assuming that we have constant specific heats or variable specific heats. If we're using variable specific heats, that is, if we're using the data that's presented in table A17, I mean, these are air, uh, these are air cycles, so clearly we're going to use A17, which is our air data. Uh, but nonetheless, if we have a problem that's variable specific heats, we would use these equations directly and we would use the internal energy data that's presented in table A17. I'll give you an example problem here shortly. Um, on the other hand, if we have constant specific heats, well then all of these internal energy change terms actually become CV times temperature change terms. And this was also something that we did last time, right? I'm pretty sure that at the end we talked about ideal gas constant specific heats. Um, so just keep that in mind that these equations are specifically used if we have variable specific heats and we have to adjust them ever so slightly if we have constant specific heats, right? So let's just look now at the case of constant specific heats. Okay, clearly we're still looking at the auto cycle. Um, again, all those equations will be slightly modified. Um, and once again, this is just review from what's already in your notes from last time. 
Okay, so clearly this is the case. Um, and the other equations, well, I'm not going to rewrite, but um, let's just go back to the thermodynamic efficiency term and specifically look at, um, well, what this equation would look like in that particular case with specific, <coughs> with constant specific heats. So, of course, we're just going to put these terms here instead of these terms here. So just 1 minus Cv, T4 minus T1 over Cv, T3 minus T2. Um, specific heats are constant, so clearly the Cvs are going to cancel. And then what we can do is we can actually manipulate this equation to get it into a form that's a little more useful to us. So what I'm going to do first in the numerator is just pull out a T1 term, and in the denominator pull out a T2 term. So we would have T1 and then times T4 over T1 minus 1. So that's our numerator. And then as we pull out a T2 in the denominator, it'll be T2 times T3 over T2 minus 1. Okay? And now what we can do is we can recognize that the processes from 1 to 2, as well as the process from 3 to 4, are isentropic. Right? This is the ideal auto cycle after all. Any work processes are isentropic processes. So since they're isentropic, um, we can actually use the relationships that were, well, um, summarized for you last week, but derived for you in your ME301 class. So for instance, we would note that T2 over T1 is just going to equal V1 over V2 raised to the K minus 1 power. This is one of those equations that perhaps you remember for isentropic processes. And, and these are Vs, so I've got to be very careful they don't look like Us. Um, let's also note that V1 and V4 are the same, right? I mean, that's the heat rejection process, that's a constant volume process. So I could just substitute a V4 for a V1. And um, V2 and V3 are the same, right? Um, that's the constant volume heat input process. So I'm just going to replace the V2 with the V3. So clearly that has to be a true equation. But we would also note again that the process from 3 to 4 is isentropic. So doesn't this volume ratio to the K minus 1 just equal the associated temperature ratio? So it does. So this is just equal to T3 over T4. Um, then what I could do is actually cross multiply. And in doing so, we have a slightly different version of this particular term. We get T3 over T2 is just going to equal T4 over T1. And now what we can do is substitute various terms into the efficiency equation. Okay? In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute exactly these terms here into the efficiency equation. All right, so let's just draw an arrow. All right, so first we would note that T2 over T1 is just V1 over V2 raised to the K minus 1 power. So I'm just going to note that T1 over T2 is the same thing as 1 over T2 over T1. So in the denominator then, I'm just going to get the V1 over V2 to the K minus 1 power. Okay. And then as far as the T4 over T1 term, um, well, T4 over T1 is exactly equal to T3 over T2. Right? We just showed that. So these terms completely cancel. And then we would just note that we have this term that's called the compression ratio, right? The compression ratio is R, and R is just the ratio of the maximum to the minimum volume for this particular uh, cycle, for this particular process. So that's just equal to V1 over V2. Um, well, therefore, the third dynamic efficiency is just 1 minus 1 over the compression ratio to the K minus 1 power. Now, perhaps you can see why this is a useful form of the thermal efficiency equation. It only requires that we know R, right? 
the compression ratio. We don't need to know any of the temperatures. <coughs> Actually, we don't even have to go through the entire cycle at all. Just knowing the compression ratio is enough to find the thermal efficiency. Now, that doesn't mean that this is the only term that's of interest to us. Certainly, we're interested in the various temperatures and pressures at all the different state points. We're interested in how much work or power is being produced, how much heat transfer takes place. Uh, but nonetheless, this is just a simple form of the equation for thermodynamic efficiency. Okay. Um, hopefully, it's also clear then that as the compression ratio goes up, so too does the thermodynamic efficiency, right? If the R term is increasing, then 1 over R is decreasing. We subtract that from 1, and therefore the thermal efficiency has to increase. So, you know, the higher the compression ratio, uh, really the better the thermodynamic performance. Now, again, this only applies to problems with constant specific heats. So, Let's look at a couple of example problems. Actually, what I want to do is I want to look at one example problem, but I want to do it twice. I want to look at it first using constant specific heats, as we've just discussed, and then I want to solve it a second time using the variable specific heat so that we understand how to do each type of problem. Okay. So here's the example. Um, we have an air standard auto cycle with the following data that's known. Um, so let's know, or let's be given that there's a compression ratio of 10. Um, let's also note that the temperature and the pressure at the beginning of the compression process, that's 0.1, is 35 degrees Celsius and 95 kilopascals, respectively. Um, and let's also note that there's a certain amount of heat input on a per unit mass basis, and that's just given as 650 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. So this would be a typical problem. This would be a typical collection of the type of data we'd be given for a problem. And what we're trying to do is find a variety of things. Um, first of all, we'd like to find the thermodynamic efficiency. Um, we'd also like to find the pressure and temperature at all state points. Um, of course, we have the data at 1, so this means at 2, 3, and 4. Um, and let's also find the network associated with this particular problem. OK, so again, a typical auto cycle process. Now, first, let's solve using constant specific heats. Now, I don't know that I really need to redraw the thermodynamic property diagrams, but I'll go ahead and draw the TS diagram anyway. Um, again, this is in your notes from last time, but just so that we remember the various state points. Um, we, we know that we're going to have isentropic compression. Um, we know that we're going to have constant volume heat input. Uh, we know that we're going to have isentropic expansion or work production, if you will. And we know that we're going to have constant volume heat rejection. So this is the basic thermodynamic process on the TS diagram. Um, we know that the process from 1 to 2 and from 3 to 4 are isentropic. So in other words, there's no entropy change. I'll just write this as ds equals 0. And we also know, again, that the heat input and in rejection is a constant volume. So I'll just put dv equals 0. Okay. Um, so how do we begin this problem? Well. Why don't we just start at state point 1? This is pretty typical. So as we go from state point 1 to 2, it's an isentropic process. So we would know that the temperature ratio is going to have a relationship to the compression ratio. In fact, it's the same equation that's still on the board over here. Uh, temperature ratio equals the compression ratio raised to the k minus 1 power. So we can find T2 pretty easily as long as we know what k is. So we're going to have to go into table A2 and find that for air, the value of K is 1.4. So make sure you go into the right table and get the right value of K. Um, having that, the process is pretty easy. So T2 is just equal to T1 times a compression ratio, which is 10, um, raised to the 0 0.4 power. Um, certainly, we remember that you cannot use Celsius, right? We have to convert into an appropriate absolute temperature scale. So we'll have to add 273.15 uh, 
to turn it from Celsius into Kelvin. Anyway, we go through our math and we find that the value of T2 is 774.1 Kelvin. Okay, so there's the first thing that we're looking for. Now, what about the pressure? Is that something we can find pretty easily? Well, sure, it's still an isentropic process from 1 to 2, so why don't we use the relationship that's similar to the one that relates temperature and volume. Um, this one relates temperature and pressure. So hopefully we remember that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Well, that's not an incorrect thing to do, but in my notes, I'm going to use a relationship that relates pressure and volume. Um, but you could certainly use a relationship that relates pressure and temperature. Uh, temperature ratio equals a pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K, or pressure ratio equals the volume ratio to the K power. So that's the one I'm going to use here. So P2 over P1 is equal to the volume ratio. We call that the compression ratio to the K power. Um, so again, it's just a matter of solving for P2. Um, the pressure at 1 is 95 kilopascals. Compression ratio is 10 raised to the 1.4 power, and we end up with 2510 kilopascals. All right, so we've now gone from point 0.1 to point 0.2. Um, the next step is to go from point 0.2 to point 0.3. Now, the process from 2 to 3 is not an isentropic process, so, so we can't use that equation. Well, so this whole bank is out. Oh, well. I'm hoping that you still have enough light for the camera work. Anyway, so the process from 2 to 3 is a constant volume heat input process. And the relationship that we have is just the relationship for the, um, well, heat input process, right? Now we know that the heat input is equal to the internal energy change from 2 to 3, which for a constant specific heat is Cv times T3 minus T2. So, quite frankly, when I was in table A2 just a few minutes ago, I probably should have also looked up the value of the specific heat at constant volume. So if you just want to go back and add this into your notes somewhere, we would just find that CV is 0 0.718. And this is going to be kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Now, please note that I'm taking this data at room temperature. Okay. I don't have any idea at this point what the various temperatures are throughout the entire cycle. I have no way to figure out the average temp temperature for the whole cycle. Th that might be a little more accurate, um, but we just can't do that yet. So um, what we typically do when we assume the air standard auto cycle is we really assume what the book likes to call the cold air standard cycle. In other words, we assume that everything is taken at room temperature. So this data here specifically applies to the room temperature data and that would be actually in table A2, part A. Um, in table A2, part B, there is a list of data for specific heats that varies with temperature. And again, if we knew the average temperature, well, sure, we could just look it up, but we don't. So let's just assume for all these problems that it's at room temperature. Even the problems I've assigned on the homework, the problems that you will eventually get on your midterm or final exams, we're always just going to assume the cold air standard cycle, okay, room temperature data. So now that we have CV, we know T2, and we're given the heat input on a per unit mass basis, so let's just solve the problem. So we have 650 uh, kilojoules per kilogram equals 0.718 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin times T3 minus T2. Um, T2 we found just a moment ago as, what, 774.1, I think. And these are all in Kelvin. So the math is pretty easy. We just solve now for T3, and we get 1679.4 Kelvin. So there's another term that we need. Okay. Um, what about finding the pressure at point 3? Um, that one might not be so obvious, but it's not exactly difficult. Um, we know, for instance, that regardless of whether we're talking about constant or variable specific heats, we're still assuming that air is an ideal gas, so PV is still going to equal RT. Um, we would also note that we're now dealing with the heat input process from 2 to 3, 
So in that case, V2 and V3 are going to be the same. And of course, R is always going to be a constant. So if I just rearrange my equation, my ideal gas equation, I would just get R over V is going to equal P over T. And again, this would be a constant, right? R is a constant, V is a constant. So therefore, we can apply this at either point 2 or we can apply it at point 3. I mean, again, ROV equals P over T at, at any point because it's a constant. And now you can see how we find P3. Uh, we know P2, we know T2, we know T3. So we just solve for P3. So P3 is just P2 times T3 over T2. And I'm not going to bother plugging in the numbers at this point, but you go through the mathematics and we end up with 5450 kilopascals. Okay. So that's how we're going to deal with the process from 2 to 3. And now lastly, um, we're going to go from 3 to 4. I guess for consistency I should have put 2 to 3 up here. Now we're going from 3 to 4. So here again we have an isentropic process, right? So since it's isentropic we can use a relationship between temperature and compression ratio. So just T3 over T4 equals R to the K minus 1. And we could find T4 then pretty easily. That's just T3 over R to the K minus 1. Um, now again, in the interest of saving time, um, we have T3. Make sure, please, that it's in Kelvin. Um, we have R. We have K. So just go ahead, plug away, and we end up with a temperature at 0.4 of 668.6 Kelvin. Okay. And then the last thing we need to do is find the pressure at 4. So we'll use the same relationship that we did before. P3 over P4 equals V4 over V3 to the K power. Although again, you could use a relationship that says temperature ratio equals pressure ratio to the K minus 1 over K. That's perfectly acceptable. It does apply to an isentropic process. But this one's just a little bit easier because then I could just plug the value of R directly in. So this is an equal, actually, 1 over R to the K, right? V3 is the maximum volume. V4 is the minimum volume in the cycle. So V3 over V4 is R. Uh, anyway, I'll let you go ahead and plug away with the numbers again. And if we go through the math, we end up with P4 as 217 kilopascals. All right. Now, what about finding the thermodynamic efficiency? Um, well, and the network. Well, again, those are pretty straightforward, right? Um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Perhaps the easiest way is just to recognize that we can use this equation. I'm sorry, there's not supposed to be a minus 1 there. Um, that we just have this relationship. I'm sorry, there is a minus 1 there. OK, sorry about that. Um, Sometimes I don't say or write the correct thing, but hopefully I'll correct myself. If I don't correct myself, then do like Mr. Harmio here and just raise your hand. I'm assuming you're going to tell me, yeah, there is a K minus 1. Um, so please do that if you, if you will, uh, just to make sure this is all correct. Nonetheless, we have all this data. We have R, we have K. So just plug it in and we get 0 0.602. So that's the thermodynamic efficiency. And then it might be noted that we can either find the net work um, by simply finding the difference between the work out and the work in. I mean, that's one way to do it. Um, the work out, of course, is from, let's see, 3 to 4, right? So this is just T3 minus T4. And the work in is from 1 to 2. So we could certainly do it this way, right? I mean, CV delta T, this is the work out. CV delta T, that's the work in. Um, but probably what would be easier is just to note that the thermal efficiency is the network over the heat input. And therefore, the network can very easily be found simply by multiplying the thermal efficiency by the heat input, which is a given data. So this is 0 0.602 times 650 kilojoules per kilogram. And we end up with a network of 391.3 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. Um, so again, either way you want to do it, you will get the same answer.
but this is a little bit shorter, so I'm just doing it this way in this example. All right, so there's a complete example problem. Um, are there any questions on this? Hopefully you see it's pretty straightforward. Um, let me just finish this by noting that sometimes you're interested in not the work per unit mass, but the total work associated with a, an engine like this, a piston cylinder device, if you will. Um, in that case, if you had the mass of the air within the cylinder, then you just multiply it by the work per unit mass, and, and that gets you the, the total amount of work. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes you're interested in the power that can be generated by this particular type of cycle. In other words, the uh, work per unit time, in that case, you'd need to know the mass flow rate, right? Mass flow rate m dot. Now, mass flow rate would certainly be used in the real world because in a real engine, you know, we've got air and fuel coming in and exhaust going out. There's a definite flow rate. In this class, we're assuming that it's just a closed cycle with a fixed mass. So using mass flow rate, um, while certainly more accurate in the real world, uh, really doesn't make sense for this particular type of problem. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, that'll at least give you something to think about regarding slight variations in the results. Um, sometimes also we're interested, or we have give, been given data for like the total heat input. Um, as opposed to the heat per unit mass, so that changes the problem ever so slightly, but the basic equations are still the same. Okay, isentropic process from 1 to 2 and 3 to 4. Um, isochoric, that is constant volume process, from 2 to 3 and 4 to 1. Use the right equations and you'll always get the right answers. Well, unless you make math errors or unit errors or conversion factor errors or sign errors, there's so many ways to make mistakes. Um, if you're diligent, you use the right equations, you get the right answers. Yes? So for the ratios, do you always want to do the maximum over the minimum? Right. Our compression ratio, R, is defined as V max over V min. So it's, you know, T2 over T1. I'm sorry, V2 over V1 or V3 over V4. Right. Okay. So with all this in mind, why don't we now do the problem the other way? So remember again, at the very beginning, I summarized the general equations. Um, the general equations for this particular case with variable specific heat are different. Okay. So let's do variable specific heats now. Now keep in mind that the thermodynamic diagram, the TS diagram, it doesn't change, right? It doesn't care what method we use for our solution. Um, so I'm not going to redo the drawing. We don't have any different state points. Everything is exactly the same. The difference is simply that we're now going to use data from, <coughs> data from table A17. We're not going to use these various equations as we go through the different processes. But the general method is still the same. We're still going to start at point one. We're still going to utilize the fact that it's an isentropic process, although granted we're going to use either relative volumes well, really, I should say relative specific volumes or relative pressures. We're not going to use these equations. We still have a constant volume process uh, for the heat input and the heat exit or heat rejection. So same equation, but we're going to use internal energy change rather than CV times temperature change. Um, but the basic method is the same. We're going to start at 1, and we're just going to go through the entire cycle. So first, 1 to 2. And this is our isentropic process. So again, we're not going to use ratios of temperatures and all that, we're going to use relative pressures or relative specific volumes. Now, which do we use? Well, it depends on what data we're given, right? If we know the volume ratio between point 0.1 and point 0.2, then we have to use relative specific volumes. If we know the pressure ratio from 1 to 2, then we're going to use relative pressures. Now, don't go back to the constant specific heat part of the problem and say, oh, I've already found P2 and P1. I, I could just use relative pressures. No, that pressure was only found using constant specific heat. We don't know. We simply don't know what the pressure ratio is. So don't even mess with it. Just utilize the relative specific volume data. So as we go from 1 to 2, let's just keep in mind that V1 over V2 equals VR1 over VR2. Right? VR1 and VR2 are the relative specific volumes. Um, we know V1 over V2. Um, that's just going to be the inverse of our compression ratio. So that's certainly something that we know. So um, V2 is, I'm sorry, VR2 then is going to equal VR1 times V1 over V2. Did I do that right? 
Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, which is then going to be VR1 divided by the compression ratio. Okay. So let's go into our table. So at T1, we're going to go into table A17. Um, clearly, if this were in the British units, you'd use table A17E. We're using table A17 because of the SI units. And at this particular temperature, we just go down the left-hand column and we read out the values directly for the relative specific volume as well as internal energy. I mean, we're certainly going to need the internal energy when it's time to do our calculations for work or heat transfer or efficiency or whatever is of interest to us. So we find that VR1 is 581.1. Um, this is a dimensionless parameter. And U1 is 219.93 kilojoules per kilogram. Right now we just supply this to the equation above and we get VR2 is just equal to 581.1 over the compression ratio which is 10 so 58.11 is VR1 and now that we have VR1 well, we just go back into our table and we look up the temperature the internal energy or anything else we need. Yes? Yes. Yep. I mean, quite frankly, it's a constant mass process. So we could divide by mass in numerator and denominator. And if you'd like to, it, it's also equal to the specific volume ratio V1 over V2. Uh, it doesn't really matter which way you think about it. But since we're given the actual ratio of volumes, I mean, that's our compression ratio. Um, so did I mess something up here? Um, VR2 is VR1 times V1 over V2. That's an, um, oh, I see what I did. Hmm. Yes. I have inverted that term, didn't I? So that's that. So VR2 is VR1 times, yeah. I guess I should be a little more careful. Anyway, so this is going to equal VR1 times, what am I doing here? V2 yeah, V2 over V1. Okay. Um, so I guess that's right now. Um, anyway, thank you. <laughs> so any, any other questions on this before I move ahead? Okay. So now let's continue. So we have our value of VR2. Um, now that we have VR2, we simply go back into our, well, property table, table A17. So at VR2, um, okay, so at VR2, we go back into table A17. Something still doesn't look right about that, doesn't it? Um, I, I may have flipped a term somewhere and just looking at my notes, I'm not really clear exactly what happened here. Um, well, it, it is correct. Um, you know what, maybe I'll just start over. How about that? We'll leave all this, well, some of that. So just to make sure it's right, we know that V2 over V1 is our compression ratio, which is VR2 over VR1. Um, and therefore, VR2 is going to equal Okay, this is not right. Um, I mean, I, I know that, yeah, what did I do here? Um, I know this equation is correct, and I know the VR2 is correct. I mean, we're, we're compressing into a smaller volume. Um, so I know that V2 is going to be less than V1. Oh, I see what I've done. This is supposed to be V1 over V2, isn't it? All right, now I have my error. Okay, V1 over V2 is our compression ratio. We right, start at point 0.1, the largest volume, and we compress down to point 0.2, which is our minimum volume. So this should say VR1 over VR2. And now VR2 is equal to VR1 over the compression ratio. And whew, we found out the problem. Um, I mean, that kind of stuff happens all the time, right? Fortunately, it's going to happen more to you than me, and hopefully everything will be right most of the time on the board. Um, anyway. Sorry about that little mistake. We now go through this. We find VR2. And now that we know VR2, now we have to go back into the property table, table A17. And here we just simply find 
of the temperature and internal energy of interest to us. So T2 we find as 747.8 Kelvin, and U2 we find as 550.24, and that's going to be in kilojoules per kilogram. Now, by the way, you're not going to see an entry at 747.8, right? I mean, you have to interpolate, so you might want to just write interpolate here, and it's very common at this point to have to use interpolation for these parts of the problem. So anyway, at least we have the data we need now at point two. Um, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to find the pressure at point two. Um, now there's different ways that one can do this, but what I always like to do is just start with the ideal gas equation of state. Um, and I want to find the actual um, specific volume at point one. Um, we would have to realize that this R is R for air. Um, so we're going to have to go into the appropriate table which is the same table we were in before, it's just table A2 part A. Um, so for air from table A2, we get 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. Um, we know the temperature point 0.1, right, it's 35, which is the same as 308.15 Kelvin. Um, and we know the pressure at 1, that's 95 kilopascals. Um, if we go through the mathematics, we'll be able to find the specific volume at this point and it's 0.931 meters cubed per kilogram. Now, I might note that if you look at the units above, uh, you wonder, well, how do we get meters cubed per kilogram out of here? But, you know, fortunately, the SI system is pretty forgiving. I mean, we know a kilopascal is just a kilonewton per square meter, right? And we also know that a kilojoule is a kilonewton meter. And that's how the units work out, right? I'm just using these identities. Now you can see that everything's going to cancel out except for the cubic meters, right? Cubic meters, there's one, there's two more. And the kilograms is going to remain as well. Everything else cancels. So these are the correct units. Um, now that we know the specific volume at one, we could simply use the fact that the compression ratio is 10. So V2 is just V1 over 10. Um, in other words, over the compression ratio. So V1 over 10, and therefore this is just going to be, well, hopefully it's obvious, just 0 0.0931 <coughs> cubic meters per kilogram. All right, so there's my specific volume at 2. Now, why did I bother to do all this? Well, again, I want to use the ideal gas equation one more time. Um, again, PV equals RT, so P is going to equal RT over V. Um, we apply this at state point two. Uh, now again, in the interest of saving time, um, we know T2 from above. We know the gas constant. We've looked it up already. We know V2 from above. So just plug in all the numbers, and you end up with a pressure of 2305.4 kilopascals. Okay, so here's the process then from one to two. Okay. Now we move on and do the process from two to three. Um, by the way, as you look at the results and you see that the numbers are starting to appear different and in some cases significantly different than we found with constant specific heats, um, that should not worry you. Um, if we assume constant specific heats, that's really an inaccuracy. I mean, it's a simple method of solution, but it's not particularly accurate. The variable specific heats is more accurate. So if you're interested in accuracy, you certainly want to use variable specific heats. So now, we're done with 1 to 2, now let's go 2 to 3. I'm just going to leave the diagram here. Okay, so for 2 to 3, this is my heat input again. So the heat input is 650 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, and this is just the internal energy change, right? So this is just going to be U3 minus U2. And U3 is my unknown. U2 I found earlier as 550.24. So this allows me now to solve for U3, and I get U3 of 1,200.24 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay. Now, certainly we need U3, but I have asked you to find the pressure and temperature at all points. So now we're going to go into our same old property table, A17, at this particular internal energy. And again, by interpolation, um, we're going to be able to find 
the data that we need. So specifically, we need the temperature of 0.3, so that's 1494. 0.4 Kelvin, okay. and then we're also going to need, uh, well, we're going to need a variety of things. Um, one thing we're going to need is VR3, right, because eventually we're going to go through an isentropic process from 3 to 4. So as long as we're already doing the interpolation, um, let's also look up VR3. So VR3 is going to be 7.241 at this particular point. Um, and then also, since you've been asked to find the pressure, well, once again, we may as well find the pressure using the ideal gas equation of state. Um, we already know V3, right? Um, now, this is where you're supposed to say, wait, we didn't find V3, but, but we did. We know that from 2 to 3 is a constant volume process, so clearly V2 and V3 have to be the same. So if you want to just go back a few steps, just show that that's also equal to V3. That's important. So we have V3. So again, in the interest of saving time, plug in the numbers. They're all here on the board. And we end up with 4607 kilopascals as our pressure at point 0.3. Okay. And now there's really just one last process. That's the process from 3 to 4. And again, this is an isentropic process. Um, we'll note that our, our compression ratio is V4 over V3. And we know that this is an isentropic process, so it's also VR4 over VR3. So 10 equals VR4 over 7.241. And VR4 then, well, is just 72.41. So now that we have a relative specific volume at state point 4, we do just like we did for state point 2. We go right back into the property tables, and through interpolation, we find the other data that we need. So at VR4, back into table A17, interpolate, and we find the temperature is 690.5 Kelvin. Um, we are going to need the internal energy. Ultimately, we're going to have to find, well, the work or the efficiency. So we're also going to interpolate to find the internal energy of 504.87 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, and then we're also going to need to find the pressure. So once again, uh, PV equals RT. So we apply the ideal gas equation at state point 0.4. Um, again, we know all the thermodynamic properties here, right? Um, now, again, you're supposed to say, well, do, do we really know what V4 is? Well, sure, because it's a constant volume process from 4 to 1. So we already found V1. Maybe you want to go back a few steps and just make that note as well, that V1 and V4 are the same. So we have that data. So we have P1. I'm sorry, we have P4. We know V4, we know R, we know T4. So again, I'll let you plug in the numbers on your own, and we get 212.9 kilopascals. Okay. So now we have all of our thermodynamic properties of interest. Um, now let's find the net work. Um, we know the net work is just the work output from 3 to 4 minus the work input from 2 to 1. Um, once again, we have all the data on the board, so just plug away and we get 365.1 kilojoules per kilogram. So there's a net work. And then last but not least, let's find the thermodynamic efficiency. That's just the net work over the heat input. And again, it's just a matter of taking 365.1 and dividing it by 650, which is given. Well, both of these are in the same units which of course cancel, and we end up with 0.562. Or if you prefer, you can write it as 56.2%. Either way is just fine. Okay. So there's a complete problem now done two ways. Um, I might note as I finish this problem that we definitely cannot use the simple version of the efficiency equation. 
Okay? We can't use 1 minus 1 over r to the k minus 1. That was specifically derived for constant specific heats. And these are not constant specific heats in this method. So you have to actually find all your internal energies. You have to actually find the network and the heat input and calculate it this way. Okay? By the way, I never actually calculated the heat output, the heat rejection from the cycle, because frankly, it's never necessary. Um, you typically don't need to calculate the amount of heat rejection. Now you could, I mean, we could have used an alternate version, one minus Q out over Q in. In that case, I would have to calculate the heat output, but that's not hard. That's just a change in internal energy from four to one. So it's a pretty easy thing to calculate if we wanted to. That just gives you an alternate method of solution. So hopefully you see now that there's many different ways to get the right results. And I'm not just talking about constant versus variable specific heats, right? Within each method, uh, there's different equations that one can use, uh, different methods of solution. So any questions? Great. This now allows us to move on to our second reciprocating engine cycle, which is called the diesel cycle. Um, by the way, in this example problem, as you're looking at the results comparison between constant and variable specific heats, um, hopefully you'll see that the results are all off by about 10% or so, right? So by making that constant specific heat assumption, we've introduced a significant amount of error into the problem. So clearly variable specific heats would be the better method. The diesel cycle. Now, the diesel cycle is different than the auto cycle. Um, it's still an air standard cycle, so that doesn't change. We're still only going to look at the ideal diesel cycle. That is, all of our work processes are going to be considered adiabatic and reversible. In other words, isentropic. Okay? So that doesn't change. Um, the big difference, honestly, between the diesel cycle and the auto cycle is the way in which heat transfer takes place. Okay? So with that in mind, um, let me put some diagrams on the board. Um, just like the auto cycle, I'd like to show both a PV diagram as well as a TS diagram. So here's a PV, and here's a TS. Um, now, on the PV diagram, we're still going to start with state point one. State point one would typically represent the ambient conditions, uh, that is the beginning of the compression process. So the process from one to two is going to be isentropic compression. All right. So we're going to compress to a smaller volume, but this is going to be done isentropically to get to state point two. Okay. On a TS diagram, this would clearly just be shown as a vertical line. So we're going to start here at one, and we're going to compress upwards to point two. Um, yeah, my axes aren't quite as perpendicular as they should be, but you'll do a better job in your notes. Um, so this is my work input. And this is an isentropic process, so I'll just put ds equals zero. And now we have the heat input process. Um, so in this particular type of engine, the heat input takes place at constant pressure. So constant pressure heat input. Okay. By the way, when I said isotropic compression, I probably should have put work input as well, just so it's clear. But here, from 2 to 3, this is constant pressure heat input. Um, now, this particular model makes sense for diesel engine if you understand the nature of the real diesel engine. In a real diesel engine, you're not going to mix an air-fuel mixture and then put it into the engine cylinder, compress it, and then burn it under the influence of a spark plug. In a real diesel engine, you're only going to put air in the cylinder, and you're going to compress that as you go from point one to point two. And then at point two, you have a fuel injection system, and you're going to begin fuel injection. Now, these are real engines, right? So it's not like they're going to stop at top center and let all the fuel come in and wait till it's completely burned, and then start moving again. In a real engine, 
Um, you're going to begin the fuel injection process while the volume is increasing, that is, while the piston is already moving from top towards bottom center. Um, and it turns out that if we model that, then it's approximately a constant pressure process. So the process from two to three should be shown as a horizontal line as a constant pressure process. Um, on the TS diagram, it would, be, it would be shown just as an angled line up to 0.3. Okay? So um, just a second. So this is my heat input process. Okay? And this is done at constant pressure. So if you just want to put a little dp equals 0, just so it's clear, that'd be great. Yes? So Right, right. The combustion process is continuing while the piston is moving down. So as the volume increases, um, you know, you're essentially losing some energy, if you will, as the volume is increasing. I mean, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, there is work being done here since the volume changes. So essentially, uh, the increased energy provided by the combustion process is countered by the work that's being produced during this constant pressure work process, uh, such that the pressure remains more or less constant. Now, in a real engine, it's not really constant pressure, right? And in a real engine for the auto cycle, the gasoline engine is not really a constant volume heat input process as well. Um, but the models we use are close, OK? And certainly in your first course in thermodynamics, these are the models we're going to use here, just to make sure that you understand the basics. Um, all of you should take ME412, or it'll be called 4120 starting next year. Um, every spring, I offer the engines class. So if you're interested in internal combustion engines, take that class. And certainly, we'll get into real engine cycles and variations to our ideal cycles that we learn about in this class. So let us move ahead. All right, so now we have constant pressure heat input. But because the volume is increasing, and this is a closed system, um, but at constant pressure, there's also going to be work input. So not only, I'm sorry, there's also going to be work output. As the volume increases, work is being done by the system. So not only is there heat input, but there's also work output. Okay. So we may also want to show an arrow up here, um, maybe pointing outwards. It shows work out. Okay. And we can show this here as well. <coughs> work out. Okay. And now we go from point 0.3 to point 0.4. And things are now essentially the same as it were for the auto cycle. Um, once again, this is an isentropic expansion process, or if you will, isentropic work output. So we have more work output as we go from 3 to 4. Now the process from 3 to 4 is isentropic, so it's got another curved line. And we end up at point 4, which is going to be directly above point 1. Over here, we have our vertical line from 3 to 4. And again, work out. So I'm just going to show two arrows pointing towards work out, because we have work out during two processes. And then lastly, we have our heat rejection process. So heat is rejected. And this process takes place at constant volume. In a real engine, when the piston is at the bottom, at bottom dead center, and the work is finished, that's when you're going to open the exhaust valve. And that's going to take place at exactly, or again, in the real world, more or less, when the engine piston is at bottom center. Um, and there's no change in volume during that process. You're simply opening a valve. Volume stays the same. Um, again, in this class, we would use that same constant volume type of heat rejection. So from 4 to 1, then, um, this is constant V, not P, like heat input, constant V. And this is our heat output or heat out. Right? So that's the basic process. What we need to do now is look at the various equations associated with this particular process. So one thing that I want to note right away is that we're still going to utilize a compression ratio. So we still have our compression ratio, R. So we still use R. Um, R is still the maximum over the minimum volume in this particular cycle. Um, so you should be able to see that the maximum volume is going to be at point 0.1 and the minimum is going to be at point 0.2. So this is still V1 over V2. However, 
in the Otto cycle, this was also equal to V3 over V4, wasn't it? But not here, right? You can see that we've moved from point 0.2 to point 0.3. The volume is different. So V4 over V3 is not the same as V1 over V2. So this just has to be made real clear. Um, so let's just note that, yes, R is V1 over V2, but specifically, it does not equal V4 over V3. They're not going to be the same. So as we utilize volume ratios within our problem solving, we have to keep that in mind. Okay? So there's definitely going to be a difference in the way we treat the diesel cycle from the auto cycle. Certainly some parts are the same. I mean, the compression process from 1 to 2 will be the same, but not the work processes. That's going to be different. Um, you know, we've got two different work processes, so certainly there's going to be some differences. Now, we're not going to talk in this class about why one might choose a diesel engine versus a gasoline engine. Certainly, there's going to be differences in power and efficiency and operating characteristics, but that's not something for this class. So, um, you can read a little bit more about this in your textbook, but not something we're going to talk about here. So, let's look now at some of the equations that we would have to utilize. Um, so, first, I suppose, um, why don't we look at the heat transfer terms? So, the heat input, well, again, just like the auto cycle, right? It's constant volume heat input. Um, we're assuming, like we've done all along here, that there's no kinetic or potential energy changes associated with this process. Um, certainly, there's no work associated with a constant volume process, right? constant volume heat input, but the fact that it's constant volume is no work. So the first law just tells me that this is equal to the internal energy change. And that's exactly the same as the previous cycle. So that's great. Um, what about the heat rejection process? Um, Uh-oh, I made a mistake. I was talking about work, but I used the word heat. So now I have to back up just a little bit. Please forget that last minute. The process from 1 to 2 is a isentropic compression process. And I don't know what's going on in my mind today. Clearly, it's not my best day. Um, from 1 to 2, it's isentropic compression. So during an isentropic compression process, um, we're not even talking about heat. We're talking about work. Again, adiabatic reversible is isentropic. There's no heat transfer. There's no kinetic or potential energy changes. So from the first law, the work input, or compression, it's just going to equal the internal energy change, U2 minus U1. So sorry about that little mistake. All right, so that's our equation, right? Same as what we had previously. Now let's look at heat input. And here is where things are a little bit different, OK? Because there is work being done. So the heat input, and that's the process from point 0.2 to 3. So maybe I'll just put a Q2, 3 here, just so we know what process we're talking about. Um, from the first law, this is going to equal the change in internal energy plus the work. So this is going to be U3 minus U2, and then plus the boundary work. And for a constant pressure process, um, this boundary work is just equal to pressure times the change in volume. Of course, in this case, this is all on a per unit mass basis, so we should really say pressure times change in specific volume. Right? And this P is the same at 2 and 3. I mean, I can put a 2 down there, or I can put a 3 down there, and it's the same pressure. So I'll just put P2. Now, why did I write it this way? Well, because that's the correct equation. But we're going to utilize the definition of enthalpy here. Remember, enthalpy is defined as internal energy plus pressure times volume. So isn't U3 plus PV3 just H3? And isn't U2 plus P2V2 just H2? So this is how we're going to find the heat input then. Okay? It's not going to use internal energies, at least not directly. We're actually going to use enthalpy terms. So there's that. And now let's look at the work output term. All right. Now remember again, we've got work output two places. Okay. We have work output during heat input from 2 to 3, so work 2, 3. Um, but we also have work output during the isentropic expansion process from 3 to 4, so we'll just put a work 3, 4 here. Now, 
work to three, well, that's the same thing that I just have above, right? That's just the pressure times the change in specific volumes, okay? Um, what about work from three to four? Well, again, this is the isentropic process. There's no heat transfer for this ideal case, right? It's adiabatic reversible, adiabatic meaning no heat transfer, no kinetic and potential energy changes. So this is then just the change in internal energy from three to four. So we'll just write this as U3 minus U4. And that would be the equation for the work output. Now, we can actually modify this just a little bit if we wanted to. Uh, not absolutely necessary, but we could combine the P2V, I'm sorry, the, the P2V3 term, which is really P3V3, and the U3 term, and get an enthalpy term if we wanted to. Um, not absolutely necessary, but I'll do it anyway for now. So we have H3 and then minus P2V2 minus U4. Again, all I've done is combine these two terms into an enthalpy term. So this would be an appropriate equation for the work produced, the work output. All right. And then I suppose for completeness, we should show the heat output. Um, again, heat output is the same as for the auto cycle. It's just a constant volume process. So again, it's just the internal energy change from 4 to 1. So U4 minus U1. And then, of course, if we're trying to find our thermodynamic efficiency, well, this is just the network over the heat input. And as such, um, we would just have to substitute these various terms in. Work out minus work in over heat input. Um, so just take these various terms as appropriate and move them over to the right-hand side here. Um, I don't know that I really need to do this. And eh, maybe I'll do it anyway. So H3 minus P2V2 minus U4. And then minus the work input, U2 minus U1. And this is then divided by the heat input, which is H3 minus H2. OK, that looks correct. Um, and in fact, we can even modify this. Um, I can combine. Uh, the P2V2 and U2 term into an H2 term. So I get H3 minus H2 and then minus U4 minus U1. And that should keep the sign correct. Um, and then divide it by H3 minus H2. And then that even simplifies more, right? The H3 minus H2 just combines into a 1. So we have 1 minus U4 minus U1 over H3 minus H2. And this would be an appropriate equation to find the thermodynamic efficiency. Okay? Now, these equations are all general equations which would apply for the situation where we're assuming that we have variable specific heats, right? With variable specific heats, we're just going to use our thermodynamic property data. Um, directly out of table A17. We'll have enthalpy data. We'll have internal energy data. Um, we'll be able to find everything on the board here just by using data from table A17, right? So nothing more really needs to be said with regards to the situation with variable specific heats. However, if we have constant specific heats, then all of our equations change ever so slightly. But not that much, right? We know that the internal energy change is just CV times the temperature change. So this just becomes CV times T2 minus T1 for the work input term. Um, for the heat input term, the enthalpy is CP times the temperature change. So this is just CP times T3 minus T2. Um, regarding the uh, net work, um, well, I guess I'm not going to put network. I'm just doing work out and work in. We did work in. We did heat in. Um, the work out, well, we're still going to have to include the P2 times V3 minus V2 term. But the internal energy change is a CV times T3 minus T4. Okay, so. That would be my work output term. And then the heat output is just going to be CV 
times T4 minus T1. And then lastly, the thermodynamic efficiency, well, the internal energy change in the numerator just becomes Cv times T4 minus T1. That's the heat out term. And H3 minus H2 is the denominator. Well, that's just the heat in term. So Cp times T3 minus T2. Okay. Now, this equation can be modified ever so slightly just by noting that Cp over Cv equals K. Um, but I'm going to get into that next time. For today, we're out of time, so we're finished. So please make sure you turn in your homework that's due today. Just add your work to the pile if you haven't done so already. Um, are there any last questions on, on any of this? All right, great. So I will see you all on Friday. Thank you.